Hello and welcome to another grid wrap. Um, this is what day is it? It's Monday. So we've had such a long weekend, we don't even know we've had one. Um, it's a long working weekend, I should say. We don't even know we have one. Anyway, I'm going to uh, make no more ado and I'm going to introduce our guest immediately. We have here Navitz Potato. Uh, who is otherwise known as Stephen Lieberman from Greenberg and Lieberman. Um, hello, Stephen, and welcome. Thank you very much. And we have Soth Janssen, who is from Area 54, um, who's been here before, is going to talk to us again, um, joining in with the subject of IP copyright and everything pleasurable. Welcome, Soth. Hi, thanks for having me in. And, of course, we have our regular guest, Tessa Harrington from Spot on 3D. Welcome, Tessa. Hello. Um, How are y'all doing? If everybody's, got, if everybody's got any questions, you can ask us these questions in chat, on live stream, or in IM in Second Life. I'm going to start it off because I think this is a really exciting subject, although perhaps people might disagree with me, but I know that in Second Life particularly, and in other virtual worlds, um, there has been much mention of copyright. Uh, for me, I laugh up my sleeve when this happens because I have been fighting a battle of copyright myself and the union that I belong to and a number of other people in the media world for decades, decades and decades. Um, so, Navit, Stephen, I'm going to bring you in first. What makes it such an important issue on the internet? Well, I... You can start on the internet or you can start in uh, Second Life or any other virtual environment. Uh, focusing on the virtual environments, obviously everything here has been created by somebody. Uh, there's nothing that hasn't, and of course, therefore, everything has, uh, is copyrighted. Mm. Um, so the content, the avatars, everything you see around you is all copyrighted material. On the internet, it's a big issue um, because... Uh, people put up websites, and those websites are important to them, and they're also their creations. And, of course, it's very, very easy when everything's up on the Internet for people to just take it, and that's not something that really, they're really supposed to do. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Basically, get your hands off our websites. And, Thoth, this affects you as well because you are a creator, aren't you? Well, that's the theory, yes. <laughs> but, well, yeah, it is a bit of an issue. And, and, and a lot of times, especially in places like Second Life or even on websites, you don't even know who the creator of something is. Um, you can look on an object, for example, there. But, um, you know, things get passed around, different rights apply to different objects, and it can get pretty confusing. Okay. Now... Tessa, I'm going to bring you in here because I know that Spot on 3D has been looking especially at copyright and um, that's partly, is it, because Navit's Potato is um, in Spot on 3D with you in partnership? Yes, he's actually our CEO of Spot on 3D and all the grids will be spinning off from it and he's also the brains behind all our security systems and legal systems because um, unlike any other grid out there, we have uh, server-side protection from what some of the more hideous uh, copybotting uh, options. And we also have a in-world dispute resolution panel that's community-driven. Um, all we do is you know, facilitate the structure for it to happen. And then if that doesn't work, we also have a great partnership with a virtual world, uh, a virtual, virtual courthouse. Hmm. com. What's the name of the judge's name again, Stephen? I'm um, spacing on his name. I'll remember it in a second. Okay. Well, I say again what that um, concern was because you uh, talked over each other so we couldn't quite hear what it was. Oh, it's um, uh, um, uh, Judge Monty Ahalt. He's a the halt. head a halt. He's the head of uh, virtualcourthouse.com, and they've agreed to do arbitration, and it is real-world pending and binding um, for our our uh, disputes if they're not handled by the community well enough and that's completely voluntary um, then they can go to uh, the judge and his network and have it arbitrated for 150 USD which is just unheard of uh, as far as the pricing mm -hmm. but they do have to go through the community first because that creates all the documentation helps cut the costs down 
Okay. So I'm going to come back to you, Stephen, because I'm going to say to you, all this content that has been out on the net so far and in virtual worlds and everywhere else, um, it's, it kind of started off with um, a Ferrari, didn't it, about the music world and about the film world. And it's gradually whittled down to the independent producer of creation, um, the creator on the grid. And it, that's when people start to feel it, don't you think? When it comes down to when they are affected personally about it. Uh, everyone who, cre who creates works, whatever they, that is, be it music or graphics, as we see a lot in the virtual world, uh, deserves to be paid for what they create. And, and the whole basis behind intellectual property is that we want to promote that and push people to create things. And that's not just within copyrights. That's within patents and trademarks as well. But mm. if you sit down and create something, you should get rewarded in some way. And the law sets out specific standards on how you get rewarded and for how long. Um, uh, under copyright, it stays around for 150 years. Under patents, it stays around for 20 years. Trademarks obviously stay around as long as you continue to use them. Mm. But... The, the concept that, that I think you were pushing at is that within the virtual environments, a lot of the material is created by uh, individuals and is sold by individuals. Mm. So we have somewhat of a micro-economy. And so each one of those individuals, if they get stolen, copyright stolen from them, it hurts a lot more. Um, yes, Sony complains very loudly that you know, people are stealing their music, but they're still making millions and millions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Whereas if somebody steals something from somebody on the grid and they don't get a couple of hundred dollars, they may actually steal it. Yeah. Absolutely. And what can, I mean, what can they do? I know that people have gone through some very complicated um, uh, adventures in Second Life, for example, um, filing DMCA uh, abuse reports and all, following all those legal procedures through Second Life. But what can they do? Really, that's after the horse has bolted. What can they do to protect themselves in the first place? Um, well, a couple of different things. One, before they even put it out there, they should be filing copyrights. Um, failure to file a copyright within, uh, well, first of all, if you don't file a copyright at all, you can't file suit against them. Hmm. One. Two, if you file a copyright either prior to publication or within three months of publication, then um, the burden is on the other side to prove that it's not theirs. And, and, and it shifts the burden and also gives the person the ability to get statutory damages. Mm. Um, I can't tell you exactly how to stop people within Second Life from stealing because I don't think it's possible. That's why we've engineered spot on 3D in a way to make it much, much harder for people to steal material. Hmm. Um, making sure that the other thing that I always tell people to do is that if you're going to sell your material, make sure you have a license agreement. Don't just say, here's a note card, and this note card is, says you can, you can use it, and that's the end of it. Have a real license agreement, and make sure people somehow acknowledge it uh, via email or a sig digital signature of some sort, so that if you find out that that material is out there, it's possibly traceable back to the person who let it out. And then you have some sort of tracking method. Okay, how does this work? Um, how would this work across uh, boundaries, across countries, across continents? Because that's what we're dealing with here, isn't it? Under which law do you set your copyright? Um, all right. Uh, now, now it's getting a little complicated. However, mm -hmm. um, most countries are members of the Burn Treaty, and under that, um, there's the uh, most you, most copyrights are honored uh, in, in I think it's about 230 countries. I could look it up for you. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so copyrights are actually are valid pretty much everywhere in the world. Um, some countries have registered copyright, some don't. Um, obviously, the U.S. does. Um, if, if you um, uh, try to file suit in, say, Second Life, based mm -hmm. upon a, someone stealing in Second Life, 
they have set jurisdiction in the U.S. in California. Uh, in Spot on 3D, we've set jurisdiction in the U.S. in Maryland. Mm. Um, so if someone wanted to file suit, let's say they're in Spot on 3D, someone managed to steal something, which I actually don't think is possible, um, then uh, they would go and file suit in Maryland. Um, if, well, actually with us, they would go to the arbitration system. Mm. Um, but if there was a suit, they would use they would use the laws of Maryland. And in, in Second Life, they just could file suit in California, and both sides would have to accept that jurisdiction. Okay. Um, so, so you're a creator, right? I've seen your intensely complicated creations. Have you have you copyrighted them? Um, have you written them? I should say. Well, on, on some of them, I've. I um, put a copyright mark in the description, um, but I don't do it all the time. I just get you know, too carried away with building sometimes. Mm. Every once in a while, I'll go through and do that. Um, I'm not really sure how you go about copywriting something in the virtual world. It's kind of hard to mail it. <laughs> mm. might, I, might I suggest that, that you're misunderstanding my terminology? Copywriting, a, a registered... All right, when you create something, you automatically have a copyright on it, no matter what, especially mm. here in the U.S., and that's called the common law copyright. Um, there is no longer any requirements that you put the copyright symbol on something, although it is strongly advisable. And when I'm talking about copywriting it, I'm talking about a registry copyright that's filed with the U.S. Copyright Office. And anyone can do that by just going to copyright.gov, logging it online, and filing it. It only costs them $35. Um, there's a very big difference between the two. Mm. There you go, Sos. You're all, yeah, but how would you copyright, say, an object you create in a virtual world to have it registered? Um, I understand that you have a, you know, when you register a frame, you can say you, you created it. But when you put them together and make an object, you know, it's made up of, you know, a number of different components. And, you know, technically it could be a bit difficult. Yes, it's the object itself would be, you know, created by you. But how do you uh, prove it? And then if somebody replicates it using a copy bot, how do you protect against that? Well, first question first. You, <laughs> you take a photograph of it from every possible angle, um, and then you go to copyright.gov and you file it. By filing it with the U.S. Copyright Office, it, it denotes that you are the creator and shifts the burden to the other side to prove that you are not the creator. So you don't have to prove it anymore that you're the one that created it. Um, point one. As for finding somebody once they've gotten a copy bot, that's a technical issue. Um, I'm sure there's many ways to do it technically. Uh, some sort of search engine within the 3D environment, something of that sort. Right. Now, Tessa, it was very important for you to protect people's copyright when you were designing Spot On and you conceiving it. Why was it so important to you? I mean, the, I'm asking as devil's advocate here. You know, I've, I've already said what my opinion is, but um, right. why was it so important to you? Well, it's really, it's really twofold. One, because I'm a creator, and um, I haven't, I've been very fortunate. I haven't had anything that I know of uh, ripped of mine, but I've certainly had multitudes of my old designer friends go through this heartache, and it is. It's a sink in your heart. Oh, my God. How could they do that? That's you know, it's it's really hard to take. You see these people go through these gut wrenching emotions of you know, I poured my heart into this game and I'm I'm only asking a dollar two, maybe three, for what I'm doing, and then you know this is my payback. So it's it's really hurtful to them because this is their art. This is this is what they've lived and, and breathed and tried to do and and are just loving what they do mm. and it's more than just collateral to them it's also things that pay the roof over their heads you know it may not be enough to pay all their bills but i know many artists in here who pay a good portion of their bills with their revenues so it's not just about you know making money or being greedy it's about meeting the family bills and there's a lot of disabled people that are in here doing this and they they need it badly they can't go out and get a job like all of us they have 